Imagine you're 10 years old. You race through breakfast, get ready for school, and hop on the bus. Then it starts. You get to school and people are screaming at you from the sidewalks. Teachers encourage other students, jeers, and assaults. On the first day of integration in the 60s, children became the soldiers on the front. The civil rights movement has its leaders, but without the unsung heroes, civil rights might have stood still. The Mississippi Delta, 1965. Here, cotton was king. Segregation, the rule. This was the south of May Bertha and Matthew Carter. They were sharecroppers who lived with their 13 children on a plantation in Sunflower County, Mississippi. Their daughter, Gloria, was 12 years old at the time. Mom and Dad talked about it all the time. She said, we got to have a better life. And she said, I'm tired of being poor. I'm tired of being poor. There's got to be a way that I can change this. And I don't want my children to have to live the way I've lived. And, and, and the way my mother lived. And the way my grandmother lived. May Bertha knew that education was the key to a better life for her family. And yet in Mississippi, a good education wasn't available to most black children. They were consigned to separate all-black schools, schools that were clearly inferior to those attended by whites. And in rural areas, the black schools were only in session six months of the year, when there was no work to be done in the cotton fields. She would constantly talk about how the answer is going to be to educate ourselves. If we ever want to get out of the field, if we ever want something better, and, and I did, even at a young age, I knew that I didn't want to chop cotton and pick cotton. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. Beverly Carter was one of the youngest of the Carter children. I remember once when we was chopping cotton, and when we got ready to go in, she checked our sacks, and we didn't have any cotton. So she made us stay down in the field. She wouldn't let us come home. She said we couldn't come home until we picked some cotton. I didn't want to have to do that all my life. I hated that. In 1965, the Carters learned that their chance for a better life had seemingly arrived. Because of the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the state of Mississippi had to give black families a choice. For the first time, their children could attend the much superior white schools. And we were like, we want to choose the previously all-white school. We want to go, we called it at that time, the white school. We want to go to the white school. What's your mom saying? She asked, are you sure? Are you sure this is what you want to do? And I can remember this, just as if it was yesterday. If you decide to do this, now remember that you need to stick it out. Because you shouldn't start anything that you're not going to finish. Integration had been slow to come to the South. White opposition was fierce. What do you think of the situation out here? I don't like it. What do you think of the situation out here? I think it's terrible. I'm going out here. I'm back. And it was often a violent and dangerous process. They shot at your house. Right, they shot at the house. What happened? I can remember being in the bed, and it was about um, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I can remember her coming to the bed, shaking me, saying, they're shooting. They're shooting. She was, she was just like screaming, they're shooting out there. Get down on the floor, get down on the floor. And the shots came in right over uh, our heads. And so, and then the next thing I can remember, my mama rushing in and saying, are you all right? Are you all all right? And I'm like, what, what's going on? What's going on? Because she was wondering, well, did we have, we gotten hit. But the shooting didn't deter them. Seven of the Carter children were set to enter the white school. The youngest going into the first grade. The eldest, the 11th. You get on the bus. Right. Head toward the school. Yes. You're a seventh grader. Exactly. You get off the bus. Paint me the picture. There were people 
on the side of the sidewalk and they were just standing there and they were like shouting I can remember and they were staring at all of us they were staring at all of us what were they shouting why are you coming here nigger why are you coming here why are you at the school you shouldn't be here how did they treat you they jumped away from me like I was contagious or to um, jump physically jump away physically jump away when I walked by or, or, would try, or would not want to sit by me, you know. And then, and then they talked about, you know, how dumb you are, how stupid you are, you can't learn, how you smell bad, and we don't want to be around you because you, you need to take a bath and, and, and all those kinds of things. And we knew what, we were taking baths every morning. We, were, we did that every day. So we knew that that wasn't true, what they were saying. Now, I think the part that is so hard to accept is the fact that the teachers did nothing. You know, nothing. And as a matter of fact, some of them even encouraged it. While every black family in Sunflower County had been given the option of sending their children to the white school, the Carters were the only ones who did. It got to the point where I would come home at night and it was like, please no chalk, you know, no one hit me with chalk in the morning. Please don't have any, let me have to take any spitballs tomorrow. Please don't let anybody put thumbtacks in my chair and think those are the kinds of prayers that I sent up every night. Did it ever get better when you were in grade school? It never got better. It never got better. It got worse. I remember not ever having any, um, anybody to play with the whole time, you know. I would just go and stand along the wall during recess. The girls in my class, I remember them ask, coming up and asking me that I want to jump rope and I'm and I was I remember thinking okay sure you know and then I remember when it was my you know turn to jump that I they, they didn't mean for me to jump they didn't mean for me to throw the rope just to turn the rope mm-hmm and that kind of hurt and then but you know I went on and, and I did it anyway because I guess it was better than being ignored and not having anybody to play with you at all. Day after day, we went through this over and over and over. How did your heart not get broken in all of that? Or did it? My heart didn't get broken because we, we all talked about it together. We'd come home in the evenings and uh, Mom and Dad would sit with us and say, okay, what happened at school today? What kind of things did you have to face? And then she would reinforce, you're doing the right thing. You know, you're fighting for your rights. You have a right to be there. And another thing that got us through it uh, is that we sing a lot. We come home in the evenings and we sing. Woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom, oh, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom, woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And once we sang those songs, we did begin to feel better. We felt we, that lip lifted us up so we could go back and face it again the next day. And then she said, don't let anybody run you away. You can't give up and let them succeed. If you give up, then they've succeeded and you failed. And we didn't want to fail. May Bertha was angry that after two years, her children were still the only black students in the Drew schools. So in 1967, she filed a class action suit to force true integration. The one-time sharecropper won her case, spurring Mississippi to abolish separate black and white schools across the state. Your mother had some kind of backbone. Oh, she did. She did. And I didn't realize that she talked about when her kids went off to school on September 3rd, 1965, that she was terrified. She wasn't convinced that we were all going to come home from school that day. Because she knew what was going on uh, in 1965 in Mississippi and what, what was happening to people who were trying to do this. She looked down the road and then she'd see the school bus finally coming and 
she uh, kind of hold her breath and then once the school bus stopped in front of the house, she'd count her kids one by one to make sure that all of them got off that bus. May Bertha Carter died in 1999, but not before she saw eight of her children go on to graduate from college. Ashton, you want to take number two? Her daughter Beverly now teaches second grade at the very elementary school where she and her brothers and sisters were once the only black children. It's amazing to think that the schools you helped integrate back in 1965 you're teaching in the same school now. That's pretty amazing. Somebody asked me once, was it difficult going back into the building in the beginning? You know, it was kind of awkward and, and everything, but... For the period? Now, uh -uh, I almost take pride in doing something I really want to do. Okay, very good. Gloria is now a financial manager for the Kellogg Foundation. When you look back at that time, do you look at it with pride, or did it haunt you? It did. It haunted me for a long time. I mean, for a long time, I would have dreams and, like, nightmares at night. And, and I would dream about the way the kids were acting and the way some of the teachers were acting. And I would just wake up sobbing and crying and just trying to get away from it. But now, I'm at a point now where it, it's a sense of pride for me. It really is. I got a quote. This is something your mother wrote once. You know you get tired sometimes working for justice and don't seem like you're getting anywhere. I feel like this is just beginning of sorrow for us here in America. I hope I'm wrong. After all this, surely a brighter day is on the way. Is a brighter day here yet? There is a brighter day here. It's a brighter day. I mean, it's not as bright as we want it to be. It's not as bright as it could be, but there is a brighter day. Africa! Africa! To be a successful combat pilot, you have to have excellent discipline. They died as Americans so that you could be free. How I hated me. You haven't done the right thing by my people. We want our freedom and we want it now. Like it or not, Captain, your orders instruct you to cooperate. 28 days of powerful experiences and world-class achievement. Black History Month. All this month on the History Channel. I want to walk by myself. You mean you want to meet Lefty? I got a right to take a walk if I want. Not where you're going. Let him go. Go on, John. Ozzie Davis and his wife, Ruby D may be best known for the roles they have played in Hollywood. also played significant roles in the struggle for civil rights. Whenever they were needed these past five decades, they were there. We in the House of Representatives introduced... Working to break down the age-old barriers of segregation and injustice. They grew up in different worlds and came to the struggle by different routes. Ruby was from the vibrant, bustling world of Harlem, where as a young girl she attended protests with her family. Ossie was a child of the South, growing up in the small town of Waycross, Georgia, where the old rules and ways held sway. Waycross, Georgia. Yeah is way far away from Harlem, New York City. More than you think, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Waycross was indeed a long way away. I was reminded, uh, you know, more than once every day of the special circumstances that uh, affected black people in that area. Uh, as a child coming home from school, being stopped by the police, taken down to the uh, station house, all of us laughing and carrying on. I must, what, five or six or seven years old. And they laugh with me and I laugh with them. And finally, they pour some syrup on my head, which they think is funny. <laughs> I'm a foolish little boy. I think it's funny, too. Then they give me some 
peanut brittle and put me on the street and send me send me home. And yet, even then I knew that I had been violated. It wasn't that they demeaned me, but they helped me demean myself. They taught me how to laugh at myself, to accept niggerization as my portion. And But even as a child, I knew that that was wrong. But I also was smart enough to know that if I didn't go along with that, some other awful thing might well happen. Niggerization. Mm -hmm. Niggerization. It's a process uh, that was, uh, it was almost as codified as a dance. To be black and stay alive and succeed was to know how to fit into the dance. had a way and the blacks had a way of interrelating with each other and we did it because it was uh, necessary for us to survive you know it was a sense where the oppressor also begged you to accept the impression it would make us both feel better if you if you could just be a nigger another day i mean then we could easier it, for everybody absolutely ossie left waycross to attend howard university the premier all-black school in Washington, D.C. The minute I stepped on campus, I stepped into a new world, a world of confrontation, a world of uh, articulation. And the students, they, they were different kind of people altogether. You know, they had a sense of themselves, and they were articulate, and they carried books around in their hand, and they made points. Uh, and they accused each other of cowardice or being Uncle Tom. Or they said, downtown, there is a place where we, we, we are not served as students. Let's go down and picket the place. And I said, ho, ho. So I found myself with the students going to picket places, not thoroughly understanding what it was all about. But there was an excitement there. There was a stimulus there uh, mm. that really lit my imagination and sort of told me what the world was like and told me my, my, my place and the struggle. He and his future wife, Ruby D, would learn much more about this struggle as they began their careers as actors. Why would you choose an occupation for which the culture you lived in was not going to beat down your door and say, oh, here's a good black actress, here's a good black actor, let's hire them today. Mm -hmm. It didn't work like that. No. At one time, I thought I was going to be a movie star go to Hollywood, you know, do great B-movies, then finally graduate to doing leads in plays and movies and things like that, and that was going to be so good and everything. <laughs> and I would read the magazines and see myself there. But then it dawned on me that I was a black girl and that, this, that, that the, the arts were not open to me in, in that respect. And I remember feeling it was a... Um, that was a, sh a, a very depressing time, uh, you know, when you, when you would, uh, when, when you'd contemplate the fact that you are black in America. And that's a whole different thing. Did you think that your art could be a vehicle for social change? There were plays about uh, racism. That's how we got started in the theater. A films were being made in Hollywood. Congratulations, Doc. There was a film that was done in 1949 called No Way Out, and it, it featured and starred a young actor named Sidney Poitier. Keep your black hands off my boy. In the film, Poitier was presented as a stand-up human being a man we were very proud of. You're a doctor. They're not yelling at the doctor, they're yelling at the nigger. He wasn't a cause, and he wasn't certainly a stereotype, mm -hmm. but something we could identify with. Time for the show. Who was it? And we were also in that film. Pass me some more, Mr. 
I just hope you whistle good and loud before you bust. <laughs> and that film and others like it convinced us that film was one of the most potent mm -hmm. um, weapons to be used in the establishment of, of, of justice. Mm -hmm. Well, lady, it's after 7.30. Let me see you do some waking up in there now. Raisin in the Sun, released in 1961, is another milestone in the history of black film, and certainly one of the milestones in the career of Ruby D. Man, if you don't shut up and leave me alone. The film dealt with a subject that at the time was rarely depicted in Hollywood, what it was like to be black in America. Why do you think you're going to gain by, by moving into a neighborhood where you just aren't wanted? Just can't force people to change their hearts, huh? And they worked to change the roles African Americans played behind the scenes as well. In 1970, Ossie became one of the first black directors in Hollywood with the film Cotton Comes to Harlem. This is uh, not a police state and that people have rights and that those rights... But their activism was not limited to their art. These past 50 years, Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis have relentlessly fought for justice, equality, and civil rights however and wherever they could. As recently as 1999, they were arrested at a New York City rally protesting police brutality. I march for the families and I march for the mothers because I don't want to march for my kids. So I'm going to march for somebody else's. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, you are my mayor too. And you have to protect my rights. That's your responsibility. So I'm here to see that you do that. When you look back at your entire life, an adult life dedicated to civil rights, did that not cost you anything along the way? Uh, yes, it cost. Uh, it, sometimes it would cost a black man his life to be involved. But uh, this is a world where you pay for what you get. The price of what I wanted, the price of freedom, I was prepared to pay. We never stopped to sit down and say how much did we lose or how much, uh, you know, it had to be done. And there were certain dangers involved if you did it, including being shot or losing jobs or losing whatever. Uh, but we were, were prepared to accept that. And in those instances where it did happen, you know, it didn't, we didn't, it, it didn't stop us. You know, this is a part of the human equation. Mm. This is what struggle truly is all about. Mm. And we realized that struggle, in a sense, was a way of life. What, what is there to do be, besides struggle, you know? Uh, um, what are the other options? What, what, what are the options? Therein is the glory, the excitement, mm -hmm. the fun the, of life, of life itself. You can either wind up being bored, uh, or you can become a cynic. I don't uh, love those. I, to me, the struggle is far superior. It was clear from the time he was in college that Bill Russell was that rare athlete who would forever transform his sport. He led the University of San Francisco to two national championships. Won a gold medal at the 1956 Olympics and would lead the Boston Celtics to 11 titles in 13 years. A mark unrivaled by any team in the history of the NBA. His most dominant trait was his tenacity. As a player and as a man, he never backed down. Entering the National Basketball Association when he did was far from easy. In 1956, he was the only black man playing for the Boston Celtics. Tell me about playing in the NBA in uh, the late 50s, early 60s. When I was uh, a rookie, in the championship series, I was the only black player in the championship series. The, the Hawks didn't have any, and the Celtics don't have one. That is a unique experience. <laughs> <laughs> you came out and said, there's a quota in the NBA. Yeah. What was the quota? Three. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's like, 
three blacks yeah. on a team. Yeah. At the time, only 15% of all the players in the NBA were black. Today, 80% are. You were active in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. You went down south, conducted basketball clinics. What was that time like? There's a certain electric tension throughout the country. And uh, basically it was dangerous. Mr. Russell, what brings you to Mississippi? One of the purposes for me to come, I'm going to conduct basketball clinics. Whereabouts? Uh, wherever the facilities are available. I'd like to do something to make the world a better place than the one I came into. And we never have any idea how to do that. Or it's just something we say every now and then. And very, very few people are privileged to act on that. Will you be conducting these basketball classes for mixed groups? Yes. For any kid that wants to learn anything about basketball that I know, I'll be glad to teach them. This is white kids and black kids. Well, do you think that you will get some white kids to play basketball with Negro kids? I think so. I don't see why not. My kids uh, play with white kids, and nobody's got hurt yet. Well, I can't save the planet. I might be able to save a half a dozen kids. When did you first decide to become active in civil rights? I never was, there never was a constant decision. Never a day when? No, I just, uh, where, where I grew up, uh, my father was an activist. In, in a sense that he would never let anybody do anything to him. In fact, we believe that, and including him, that if we had lived in Louisiana instead of moving to California, that he would not have lived to middle age. That he killed him? Yes. And so, uh, When, I, when, I, when the civil rights stuff came about, I was basically, uh, I think it was selfish in that I demanded that I be treated with respect. And I would never let anybody come to me into my face and treat me with disrespect. I was not going to do that. There was a trip when the team went down to Lexington, Kentucky mm -hmm. to play an exhibition game, I think. Right. Tell me about it. I get to Lexington a little late. And I get in my room, and Casey's my roommate. And I get ready to go down, join him for a pregame meal. And he gets off the elevator and says, where are you going? I said, going east. He says, not down there. He said, they're not going to serve you down there. Okay. I'm going home. What do you mean? I said, I'm going home. Casey said, well, you're not going to leave me here. And so Casey said, that's, I said, that's two. And then Sam and Satch had come into the room by then. And they said, well, we're all going. All four of the Celtics' black players, Casey Jones, Sam Jones, Satch Sanders, and Russell, told Coach Red Auerbach they were leaving. He says, what about the game? I said, I'm not going to play. He says, why? What is this about? I said, well, Casey was down to eat, and they wouldn't serve him. Well, I'm going to go someplace I get a meal. And he says, well, wait, let me find out what's going on. So he called, he called back, he said, listen, the gym manager of the hotel has invited you guys to have dinner with him and his suite. I says, Red, I don't know him. I have no interest in socializing with him. I mean, I don't want to eat with him. I don't know him. I am only I was only interested in having a meal. Period. And so uh Red says, Well, he says, let me call you back in. And he called back and says, well, they said, if you can go in and eat now, and they'll serve you, and, and they will never be segregated again. I said, Brother, that's insufficient. I don't care about that. I'm going home. So we all left. And uh, all the black guys left. The other team found out about it, and the, those black guys would play. So it's an all-white game. So I think it's the last all-white game in, in the history of the NBA. <laughs> In 1966, while still playing for the Celtics, Bill Russell was named the team's coach. He was the first black head coach in the NBA. 
Was there any thought in your mind, I'm breaking new ground? Did anybody call you up and say, hey, you know what you are the first of? Well, yeah. At the press conference when they announced I was coaching, a uh, couple of questions that were, I thought, very interesting. Bill, this is a sensitive question, but it's One was, can you coach the Celtics and be fair to the white players and not be racist to the white players? Yes. Which I thought was a fascinating question, because I'd never heard it asked of any coach, ever. Coach, the, more, the most important factor is respect. In basketball, we respect the man for his ability, period. And the other question was, uh, is it special significance to you being the first black coach in the NBA? And I said, it'll only be significant in the future when black coaches are hired and fired and you don't know what the race is. Then it would be significant. Do you think we have civil rights in America right now? Complete and total? No. Uh, but we're working on it. We used to say, well, I hope to see this in my lifetime. Well, I want to see it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> It was here, in Montgomery, Alabama, in 1955, that Rosa Parks, called by many the mother of the civil rights movement, refused to give up her bus seat to a white man. Her act of defiance and subsequent arrest led to a 382-day boycott of the city-owned bus company and catapulted the cause of civil rights into the national arena. Her name and face are now known around the world. Irene Morgan's name and face are known only to a handful. But in 1944, 11 years before Rosa Parks, Irene refused to give up her seat on a Greyhound bus traveling from Gloucester, Virginia to Baltimore, Maryland. She was a young mother raising two children who never set out to be a hero, but her one act of defiance would prove historic. The bus was crowded. And you had to sit, the blacks had to sit to, at, the, at the back of the bus and the whites up front. So I was seated where we were supposed to sit, so many seats in the back. You were sitting I in was the black section of the in bus. In the black section of the bus. Three quarters of an hour later, there was a white couple that got on. They wanted uh, us to get up so that they could have the seat. I said, I refuse. No, I'm not. I said, I, pay, I have my ticket. I paid my fare. So the driver said that he was going to uh, have me arrested. So he was stopped when he got to the filling station. This uh, sheriff got on there, and he said that I would have to get up and give my seat to him. I said, no. He put his hands on me, you know, to, uh, to arrest me. So that's when I kicked him. And then he got off. He was bent over, and then he got off and went off. And no, wait a second. Where did you kick him? It was a very serious place for the mail. <laughs> so then that's when he got off. He hobbled off the bus. And then after that, uh, another sheriff came in. And he had a warrant in his hand for my arrest. And he tried to give it to me, and I just tore it up and threw it out of the window. And then when he started to put his hands on me, he had, uh, that's when I really used to claw at him. You clawed this guy? Claw, oh, yeah. yeah. In his face and his clothes. I, was, I tore his shirt and he had it on him. So uh, yeah, he was bleeding when he left. And that's when he was very angry and said what he was going to do with the nightstick. What was he going to do? Oh, he was going to beat me. He told me, I'm going to beat you with this nightstick. With, with he was going to beat you with this nightstick? With that stick. stick. When he got outside, I said, well, then we'll beat each other. Is that a lifetime built up inside of you? When What made you react that way? You just you can't help but react that way. It was spontaneous. You just do that. If something happens to you that's wrong, and you know you're going to protect yourself. And that was what I did. Irene was tried and found guilty of violating Virginia's segregation laws. But she refused to accept her conviction and kept appealing, all the way to the United States Supreme Court. 
There she was represented by a young black attorney named Thurgood Marshall. 21 years later, he himself would make history as the Supreme Court's first black justice. Did you think once it got to the Supreme Court, you really had a chance? I felt I did. I felt much better when it went there. I did. And, uh, and Thurgood Marshall, well, he was just excellent. Marshall based his case on the idea that separate seating for whites and blacks was a, quote, burden on interstate commerce. The court agreed, and in the process, struck a crucial blow against legalized racism. And so the decision is made, and the Supreme Court finds in your favor. What was your reaction to that? Well, very happy. I was very happy, very pleased, and... I realized that they had, it, what they had done was the right thing. They proved that that was wrong, that what had happened to me, and they had to correct it, and they did. You don't have to ride in cross. And Irene was not soon forgotten. Black and white freedom riders, intent on testing the Supreme Court's decision, immortalized her in song. And when you get on the bus, and when you get on the bus, get on the bus, said any place, cause Irene Morgan won her case, you don't have to ride in court. And in the summer of 2000, Irene was honored by the Virginia town where 56 years ago, she began a journey she would never have imagined. Would you describe yourself as a reluctant hero? I don't even describe myself. I just go along with life as it is and take every day one day at a time. Not a hero, just a person. I think anybody would have done the same thing. When he first stood at a church pulpit addressing the congregation, who would have thought that one day Martin Luther King Jr. would be preaching to the nation that he would lead a crusade that would change America. Any blisters yet? Well, no blisters yet, but uh, my legs are a little tired, but I can follow that up by saying that my soul is resting. That we, the Negro citizens of Montgomery, Alabama... He was seen by many as a modern-day Moses, leading his people to freedom. Wherever he went, he urged America to let go of its old ways, to no longer be a nation of black and white, but one nation, indivisible. He was determined to make the lives of blacks in this country better, no matter what the cost. On April 3, 1968, King arrived in Memphis, Tennessee to lend support to the city's striking sanitation workers. That night, King made his way to a church to speak, as he had on so many nights in so many cities. But that night's sermon would be remembered forever, for it would be his last. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. April 4th, 1968. Death of Martin Luther King sitting at home, uh, watching the television. I don't know whether we'd had dinner already or not, but a family time, a family moment, and that news comes. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. It's, it's always personal, and you blame yourself for somehow having not protected the leader or not saved him even from himself. And that awful moment of, of the guilt you feel that you didn't stop him is one of the first reactions you have. Mm. And then a long, hard sigh and looking at each other with nothing to say but shaking your head. Death. So final. And it's so futile to try and moralize it or rationalize it that presence that stops the conversation. 
I remember just being mad, angry, because um, we we talked about every um, black person that had ever tried to champion justice and uh, defend the helpless and make the government make sense. They, they, they were killed. What does it mean to you, though? Did you ever think, mm. look what they did to this guy, and if they're going to do it to Martin, they'll do it to anybody else? Well, I'm not sure we expressed it in just that sense. Mm -hmm. We knew going in that there would be terrible prices to pay. But it never occurred to us that the struggle should stop merely because the leader had fallen. That would be the most profound form of treason. If ever you were going to fight the battle, that was the time to do it. You know, you're born into a world where there's good and evil and you make a choice. And if you choose the good, evil's going to be there and it's going to outlast you. No matter what victories you win, you know, there's always going to be another area of the struggle. So if you're not fighting uh, segregation here, you're fighting poverty there. Uh, you're fighting something over there. Mm -hmm. And you will be. That is the nature of being alive. Mm -hmm. In America right now, is there freedom and equality for all? No. Not now. Uh, therefore, America is still not America. But it will be. It has to be. Because the option is unthinkable. The, the ultimate. America will ultimately fulfill its own dream yeah. or destroy itself. It, there's no middle yeah. path. Why aren't we there yet? I don't know. I, 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 I really don't know, but I think it's coming. And I think it's, we're doing better than we have been uh, in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways. But because, but because we're still talking about it. We're still caring about it. We're still struggling. Uh, we're still scrambling our way, you know, uh, to, 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 to the glory of, of the promise. There was a moment, you know, when it looked possible, when that dream of America seemed to be coming true. We missed it. Uh, it'll come again, and we may miss it again. But we have to continue going. We have no other option. Someday, it will happen. I doubt if we'll be here. But it'll happen to our children, our children's children. And that's going to have to be enough for us. Mm-hmm.